So now it's my pleasure to bring up on stage uh, something that I've been looking forward to. It's a, a panel led by Greg Tapalian and Macy Fecto and Peter O'Neill. And they're going to give us a, a totally um, a, a different but very, very, and very, very important take on, on HR as, as really something to, to build your brand. Thank you very much. So really excited about, about this session. This is really all about building a culture, attracting great people, retaining great people. I think if, we, if I asked any of you, no one would argue about are people important to the success of your business, right? A, a number of our speakers have even called out stars from their teams. I couldn't do it without so-and-so, right? That was right, right from the beginning of the day. Um, no one would argue with that. But the question is, do we all have great cultures? Do we spend enough time on fostering an environment where we attract those people and we retain those people? So this topic came up. Sam initially said, you know, I love it. I'd love to you know, pull a panel together and go get uh, you know, innovative and, and forward-thinking leaders to, you know, to, to talk honestly about this. And, and I tried to do that, and they weren't available. Um, so, uh, I wonder how I got invited to this. Yeah, so uh, it's you. great to have you guys. Um, so no, this is, this is a, terrific, a terrific panel. While I'm moderating, I will also be sort of participating as a panelist. And we tried to, to balance around size of company, commercial, association to get a, a variety of, uh, of topics. And just to set the stage, uh, just to give you some stats. So I read a, a great article in uh, the Harvard Business Review around companies that focus on culture. So just some stats to support this. So companies that really focus on it, 54% of them have a higher NPS score with their employees. 53% of them have employees that are more engaged. 29% have more employee-led innovation, so people coming forward with ways to drive the business. And maybe most importantly, 27% show increased revenue over companies that don't focus on culture. So I think a great place to start would be, Macy, if you'd start, I think we should talk about our cultures. What are we doing? How are you doing it? OK, I'll give you a little history on AI, access intelligence, where I joined them in 2001. And the reason I go back to history is I think culture is definitely an evolving thing. You can't write, this is what our culture is going to be, or dictate it from the top down. I think it, it has to evolve with time and with the conditions. And when, when my CEO, Don Pazor, and I joined the company that is now AI in 2001, 9-11 happened shortly thereafter. We were largely in telecom, in newsletters that focused on telecoms, and the revenue was falling fast. So we had introduced something called summer hours uh, that first summer and had everyone go home at 3 on Friday. And I think a lot of companies do this. But after 9-11, we thought, we know revenues are falling. <laughs> the trade show business may be really hurt by this. Travel was affected. And what can we do to really motivate people? And we extended those summer hours through the rest of the, that year. And we've never taken them away. So it's not just summer. It's every Friday all year long. All of our offices close at 3, which is a little bit of a unique thing. But it was one of those things where we didn't plan to do it. It was sort of a reactionary. And to this day, so 17, 18 years later, it's one of the things that people really value and helps me with recruitment and re retention. I like to say that every, every week you get one day where you go home and it's still light outside, even in the <laughs> winter on the East Coast <laughs> where it's cold and dark. Um, and so, so that's one example of something that AI has done. And another thing, just to give one more quick example, not hog all the time. Um, we are in suburban offices, largely. We're in Rockville, Maryland, Norwalk, Connecticut, um, a suburban area of Houston. And it's harder to recruit young talent. So eight years ago, my CEO and I came up with a plan um, called media, our Media Associate Program. And we recruit inside some chosen universities. We do cognitive ability testing to get the brightest people. And we put them through a 
fully paid, um, full benefits rotational program where they spend three months in each sales, edit, um, marketing, and digital analytics. And it's through all of our products. It could be a trade show, a newsletter, a magazine, web product. And at the end, they're sort of sought after, and leapfrog up is the, is the goal. But what really helped our culture was bringing in younger people, which is hard to find in the suburbs, because everyone wants to be in the city, live in the city, and not have a commute. I don't know, so, Norwalk's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Peter, association perspective. How, what is your culture? Do you guys have a, a manifesto? Uh, a set of values or beliefs right. that you put forward? So no manifesto right now. So I'm two years, to about two and a half years into a new uh, job at a new organization, ASIS International. Um, and I, my colleague Andy Artal is back there, he'll help keep me honest. You know, I think that we very much are a culture in significant transition. What I, what I found there and Andy and, and all the fine folks we've recruited to bring in, we've been managing, we've managed about 56% turnover, actively managed it. Um, those were not surprises to us. Um, as we've gone through this journey, but um, I, I can prove it at ASIS International, I can prove it at AIHA, my last job, that culture with the numbers that you reported from Harvard Business Review, um, those numbers bore out for us. So I spend a lot of time on culture because human talent's my greatest overhead cost, and if I can get all those folks moving in the same direction and treating each other with respect um, and the same courtesy they want others treated with, it's all the basic stuff we learned when we were in kindergarten. Um, from a bottom line perspective, because ultimately I'm a bottom line guy, I don't spend time on culture because it's something that's fun, I've got nothing else to do. It really does impact the bottom line. And at ASIS International, we really don't have a manifesto of sorts. Um, at AIHA, we, we did of sorts, but to me it was more about how are people working together and getting things done, how are ideas coming through the pipeline. Um, the speaker this morning talked about, um, you know, you can really only have one or two good ideas a year. You can't act on every single person's great idea. Do we have a fair and transparent process so people felt like when theirs wasn't selected that they could get behind the other persons, et cetera? So to me, it's about having fun. People want to work with the people that are around them. I think uh, Andy Ortao will attest at ASIS that, um, you know, we're in a total turnaround situation and there, are, there have been some very challenging days where, you know, as I sort of joked, there's, there's, if you're not laughing, you're crying and there's no crying at work, right, Andy? Um, and so if you're not having fun and you don't respect the people that you're doing this work with, whether you're in the suburbs or you're in you know, the middle of Manhattan, it doesn't matter, they're not gonna wanna come do the work. Very good, and, and from, um, from the Clarion perspective, we do actually have a manifesto, a series of values, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put them up, um, and you're welcome to read them. I'm not gonna read them off. I think it's maybe more important to talk about sort of how we develop them and what was the reason behind doing it. So this was something I did. I took over as CEO of Clarion's North American business in September. I became a part of Clarion through acquisition. I started a company called Leftfield Media, before we had a show, I had one employee, we had a cultural manifesto, because I felt it was very important for us to have a vision, to have clear values, and to have something that I had a dream of, hey, when we're hundreds of people and you know, tens of millions of dollars of profit, we'll be able to look back at this, right? Uh, and we, at that point, had no profit. So um, one of the things that was important to me was, so in September, it wasn't something I did alone. It wasn't something I said, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm the guy, so I'm gonna tell you what the culture is. The leadership team came together. We talked about what mattered to us, and the perspective that I put forward was, I want this to be a place I wanna work. I want this to be a place you wanna work. So let's develop values that would be that place, right? No one's telling us what we need to look like or be like, so let's, let's create it on our own. And very, very important was empty values, I don't think really mean much, we gotta live it, right? If you're gonna say something about customer centricity, or ability to innovate and fail, if you then turn around and set up a comp structure that, that penalizes someone for trying something new, you're not living it, right? So that was a really important thing that it became very real for us. So um, some of these are some of our core values. Again, you can read them. They're all really around focus, right? The focus is on what? A moral compass. It's around our, our customers, it's around challenging the status quo. We're not afraid to make mistakes. It's around innovation. 
right? So the, 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 the whole point of this to me was I wanted to give clarity and purpose to the organization. I know why I'm here. I know what's expected of me. And the fact is I've made my career largely around challenging and innovating and doing new things. And I want people to do that. And I want it to be a place where you're not afraid to get in trouble. Um, how we live our values. As I said, this is really important. We, we do, there are ways we force these, these values on people so they're not just a thing sitting on the wall you know, as, as you walk in. A, a town hall meeting. These are places where we are transparent about what we're trying to do and what we're trying to build. Um, other ways we do them, Macy, I think you touched on it, workplace time flexibility. We just rolled out summer hours and, I, and, and already started to get some nice emails on that. So um, th those, are, those are the types of things. Treating people like professionals and adults goes a long way. Um, so again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, jump through these uh, so that you, know, you can read them yourselves. So OK, uh, first poll, only poll. Uh, does your organization have a cultural manifesto? Where are you on this process of establishing these values? Oh, that's right. We can't see. And there we go. Oh, so more than I would have thought. All right. So 65% of you already have one, which is great. Some of you are there. and. 24% think this is just a terrible panel <laughs> and uh, would like us to end quickly. Well, I think the, uh, cha I think the challenge with, for, the, for the folks that may have answered D, don't plan to have one, is that the, the, the feeling may be that it's more than just writing it down. I think that you, know, you always have those companies that will write a lot of things down that they then don't follow. So I think a lot of times folks that fall in D, I, I sometimes fall in D, so I, I think maybe I'm empathizing. Um, I think they sometimes feel like, well, why, why write it down? Why not just do it, be it, act it kind of thing? I think it is important at some point to codify it. I know at my last job, I was at AIJ 15 years, the last eight as CEO, and we had codified a lot of things that we didn't actually follow. So when it came time to write another, what you're calling cultural manifesto, staff was like, well, really? You know, like, why don't we just get rid of the people that aren't actually doing the things, or either are doing things we don't want done, what I call the what and the how, that their how is getting in the way of the what. And I think that's a big part of, of why people pick D. It's not so much that they don't want to codify it, it's that they'd rather probably do it, act it, be it, and then let the culture speak for itself. So follow up, right. Peter, follow up question yeah. to you on this. Do you consider culture a part of your association's strategy? Yes. Macy? Absolutely. Okay. And this easily, culture really, it's all about people, right? <clears throat> so the, the idea of having a nice culture, I think you said it, Peter, is it isn't just nice to have. I think it's critical, right? If you want to retain and attract great people, if you don't have a great culture, you're, you're at real risk. Macy, how, how do you show your people that they're valued? Well, the main thing we do and what we really strive to do is give people responsibility early in their career so they get a taste of sort of owning a business, owning a portion of a business, running a business, and those are the people that we want. We want people that strive to be business leaders. So we try as early on as possible to give them responsibility where they really, even in that media associate program I described, so they have that ownership. And um, I think that really speaks when people read about us on Glassdoor or, or LinkedIn or, or talk to their friends. Um, that's the thing that will come out the most, is that if you want to grow your career quickly, AI is a place you can do that. That's a good reputation to build. Peter, how about you? You know, I'll give you an, a different, I'll take, I'll go a different approach on this. I think that, I think that the people around you watch what you do, and then they go behave the way you do, right? Whether they're your children, or they're your employees, or your teammates, or whomever. And I've always tried really hard in the organizations I've been a part of, of, of leading and managing and building and whatnot, to be willing to not only model the way, as Kuzis and Posner say in the Leadership Challenge, but also be willing to take obstacles, human obstacles, out of people's way. Um, our last speaker was talking about you know, the, the, our favorite people in the office, and we've always done it like this, or 
do you know we really do it like that? And I think at some point those people just have to be removed. Now, I don't mean like in a nanosecond, it might be three nanoseconds, but I think what happens, <laughs> right Andy? But I, think what ha <laughs> just, but I think what happens in too many organizations is we as leaders, wherever we are in management, does not matter we're the CEO or the owner or, or we're a department head, it matters not. What are we doing to remove those human obstacles around people who, who, who watch often those human obstacles be rewarded? So the tactic I would take is benefits matter, certainly. When you're in the suburbs, what attractive package, all those things matter, don't get me wrong. But I think the biggest thing that most leaders miss in, in organizations is they don't get rid of the people who need to be gotten rid of. Because the, in my opinion, when the how intersects, when the how overshadows the what and the how is somehow negative or it's against the cultural norms you're trying to establish, mm -hmm. when those people are seen as winning, and they're usually a minority. They're almost never, in my experience, never been the majority. It's usually a variable of one, by the way. But, but people watch that person and how management interacts with them or allows them to continue that. And if they're allowed to stay, worse, stay too long, then it totally erodes what you, what you the 98% of the others want to build. And that, I, so I would answer. Yeah, so, so that's answer about that transparency and feedback, right? That's a part right. of, a, of a culture, and that was, yeah. if, you read, if you read the stuff I had up. Giving people honest feedback is a part of our culture, right? If someone's not cutting it, they're going to know. There's right. not going to be a surprise. We're not going to find out at some <clears throat> annual review. Right. They're going to know, and they aren't going to last. If but it's all, right, but I think yeah. a lot of it, too, is what are their peers saying about them? And I'm not talking about 360s for everybody because that becomes a whole big thing. In fact, I'm, I'm anti-performance evaluation these days. Um, my HR pr partner is not wild about that, by the way. Um, our lawyer isn't wild about it either. But, um, <laughs> but I can prove it works. I can prove it works. Talk to me at the break. Um, but it is a matter, I think, of making sure you support the staff in the office that want to get the real work done and you remove the noise or the obstacles that are in their way. Yeah. Okay, so let's just switch right over to attracting people, right? So we've talked a lot about kind of establishing a culture that would make people happy, but most studies will show that income and those sort of tactical variables are not the biggest driver. Most people have asked, what's the most important thing? It is softer things, like the kind of people they work with, the kind of environment it is, chance for advancement, chance for inclusion, much more than just pay me the most. Um, so Macy, how do you search for talent? Well, we use all the traditional methods, of course, LinkedIn and Glassdoor and word of mouth and so on. But I'll, I'll jump ahead and say that 40% of our hires consistently over the last five, probably more years, come from employee referrals. And we do have a small bonus for that. But I think that word of mouth, to your point, Greg, is, is huge. And I think I get the best employees when they have learned about what it's like to work at AI and are interested and, and seek us out. Yeah. Peter, how about you? Yeah, what, what Macy said, so I won't repeat that, but also um, it's cultivating a network. So I've been cultivating a network for 23 years. Everywhere I go, I come to this event, I see old friends, which is great, meet new friends, which is great. And it becomes, and you probably do this as well, right? And most people in the room probably do this, it becomes a mental Rolodex. And you start to know that, you know, John or Joe or Mary or Susie are still at X or have moved on from X to Y, and maybe they don't fit where you are right now, right? But then you move on to a new job and suddenly you really want, you know, John or Mary or Susie or, or who not, who, what not, and you make a personal phone call. So a lot of it, and I would be willing to bet folks in this room do this, is you're cultivating your own networks. The other natural ways are the ways you do it, right? Friend of a friend, you'd love to get an employee referral who doesn't want to, to have a friend come and ho hopefully have the same experience that you know, you've had in the company or in the organization. But a lot of it for me has been cultivating a network. On that note, I'll hit you with my resume from Gmail later. Um, I already have it, don't worry. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so cultural fit and hiring, right? There's, you see resumes, you can measure skill, you can measure experience. They've run shows for 10 years, they've sold booths for five, whatever, whatever it might be. Are you guys, do you actively look at people through the lens of are they going to fit with our culture and our people and our way of operating as a business? We definitely do. Um, I don't use outside recruiters, so my HR managers and directors do all of our recruiting. And what that allows is they have intimate knowledge of each of the business units and the people that are looking for 
to fill this open position. And so that, that is factored in, in terms of cultural fit, energy, uh, personality, et cetera. Yeah, I think you hit on something that's really important. I think that the, the CEOs or other department heads who don't see HR as, a, as an absolute strategic partner are making a very big mistake. Um, I still talk to peers, even in 2018, who, who kind of keep HR over here on the side, who you know, kind of relegate them to, well, they do the annual, they oversee the annual performance evaluations and they you know, oversee the budgets and they pay the, you know, make sure the insurance gets paid that needs to be. That isn't really how I've ever looked at HR. I've always looked at HR as a very strategic partner. We have occasionally gone out to use a recruiter, different reasons, right, that you have to sometimes. But we make sure that recruiter understands not only our, our mission and vision, because that's, that's too pithy and that's too easy, but that they really spend time with the hiring manager and or the team or teams of people. We tend to use a lot of matrix-based teams, so that, that can come into play. But to make sure that, again, it's the what and the how. They got in the door based on the what on their resume, unless they boldface lied on their resume, which is rare, but happens. You know, you got to assume that, they're, our candidates are basically told, you got to assume that your what's really good or you wouldn't be in here. Now you have to talk to us about how, how do you accomplish these goals? Where do you work on, with teams? How well do you work alone? If it's a kind of job, you know, if it's an editor job, you know, they're working alone primarily all day long. They might have to interface with, with um, experts, SMEs and whatnot, but if you're hiring someone in sales, completely different thing, right? So it's not a one size fits all, but I think HR is an absolute key. Um, the HR team is an absolute key part of that. And, and lastly, and you probably do this as well, most of you folks in the room probably do this, but you know, have multiple people interview these people. Mm -hmm. You cannot just have, in my opinion, the hiring manager have it be his or her sole decision. If this person's gonna interact with you know, three or four other people primarily, for example, they've got to be interviewing this person. It's not that their decision or their input rules the day, it's that, that, that multiple points of input help get to this, you know, speak with one voice, we call it in my office, um, where everybody feels that they had a part of the decision-making process, so they're willing to support candidate B when maybe they really wanted candidate A and their friend really wanted candidate C, but you know, the good of the whole spoke and everyone sort of agrees, look, B is the right candidate. You get more buy-in from the employees that way. I couldn't agree that more way. on that yeah. one. That, that is, that, that's a, so for us, one, developing and actually articulating this is the, you know, I think sometimes we think things are transparent and everybody thinks of us the same way. If you don't articulate it, if you don't write it down, my opinion, I, I don't think they will. Like, I think, you know, lots of companies may think they have a very strong <laughs> set of values. But if you really stopped the average employee in the hallway and started talking about, hey, what's our viewpoint on risk? You know, they, they, they wouldn't know, <laughs> right? Um, so for us, it was, this is something we could actually hand to a new employee. We have, uh, generally speaking, a candidate will have to meet with four or five people. I try to meet with as many as I can, even if they're not direct reports, just to feel the fit. Right? Are they someone who's going to excel in our environment? Which is a good transition to the persona of talent. Right? So something that we spent a bit of time on is, you know, if, if there's a certain type of person that really succeeds at Clarion, let's talk about what they, what they look like. And, and let me be careful here. I know I have HR on the stage. I don't mean look like. <laughs> in a, uh, do they have a set of traits and personality? Do they have, and the answer to us was, yeah, actually the people we think of as stars tend to be really customer focused, tend to be willing to take on and wear lots of hats, right? They, they don't need really narrow definition. They're high energy. Uh, there's a, I'll clean it up for you, but, but I, I've got a no jerk policy and it's a little dirtier than that, but like, <laughs> I, I don't really want to work with people I don't want to work with. Right. And, and I'm sure all of you feel the same way. So if someone comes in and the feeling is, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to be sitting next to this person every day. So how about you guys? Do you have, are, are there any criteria you look at and say, these are things we're looking for beyond the experience? I, I think everyone probably has a no jerk policy. I think that's what you're doing the multiple rounds of interviewing for. Um, and you know, somebody once said to me, hiring someone is like getting married after a 30 minute date. And <laughs> it's so, true. <laughs> so you know, the more people you have meet, the better that filter is, um, Greg, to weed out those kinds of people. The other thing that we do that may be a little controversial is um, a cognitive ability test. And we happen to use the Wonderlick. And the reason I do that is 
to your point on multitasking, you know, and shows are a fast-paced environment. There's a lot of details. There's a lot of things going on, and we really try to weed out slower thinkers, to be honest. I want people that can get it and jump and react quickly. So that's the other piece we use. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think also, you know, you want to be careful, I think, whenever you're hiring uh, anybody in, a, in an office of any size, you know, that you don't get the Stepford wife mentality, that you're not getting everybody that thinks exactly the same way, right? It talk, I, that goes to me around diversity and inclusion. People normally think of diversity and inclusion in, in a very specific way. I think of it in a very broad way. And I think for a 21st century organization to be successful, they've got to have a real, um, They've got to take a real, some real moments in time and really cultivate a real DNI program. And I don't mean a DNI program, maybe the more in the more traditional way. I do. That matters. I'm not saying that. But to me, it's as much around how do people think. You know, I you know I was sharing with someone we had it last night. At, um, we were talking about working with people, and I said, you know, I think it's a fringe benefit when you like the people you work with. Um, I worked with somebody at my last job for a decade, and to be totally honest with you, I couldn't stand her. I, I, I didn't, we traveled a lot together. I didn't want to go have dinner with her. I didn't want to have a glass of water. I couldn't, I did not like her. But I'll tell you what, she was one of my, I know, didn't you love that, John? Um, one of my best hires ever. Is she in the room? No. I know. I, I don't know. I, I, not in the business anymore. I, wow. And by the way, she knew I didn't particularly care for her because it was also vice versa. But I will tell you, in fairness, but I will tell you what, she was one of my best hires ever. She was one of my best project managers I have ever worked with. She knew what I call you know, teach a person to fish. You know, she really knew how to pass on, to, in particular to uh, more junior employees, her significant abilities around project management and things like that. Um, my board of directors loved her. She actually came from that particular profession. Very difficult to do when you come from your, in an association, you come from your profession, and now you're suddenly on the paid professional staff. You're no longer their peer, but you're, you don't know yet, and in her case, she actually, she actually embraced association management, got her CAE. So in that way, she embraced, you know, a different profession. But it's a very difficult transition for someone to make, and I give her a ton of credit. But I didn't care for, her. you know. And my point is, I really think it's a fringe benefit to like the people you work with, because we spend so much time with them. But if they do good work and they're thought provoking and they push teams to be better, different, more, to me that matters more than. Do I like them now? The jerk factor notwithstanding, you know, this person happened to be, she was well thought of, she was a good teammate, her how and her what, they, they measured up with, with, with the other. It wasn't like a tipping point of, oh God, nobody could. It was just a personal thing for little old me. <laughs> so thinking about retention, right? We've talked about establishing yes. a culture, <laughs> driving that culture home, uh, attracting great people, retaining them. Right? So now you've got this pool of great people. How do you retain them? So we're going to do a fun little, I like this whole uh, word bubble thing. It's pretty cool. So there, Some there, little things for yeah. dragons. There is, there is a technology that exists called Glint, G-L-I-N-T, if you want to look it up. Uh, it is basically an HR technology tool that it helps measure employee engagement. Right? So it's an engagement tool. And the real purpose of it, or the real value of it, as they propose, is that it really helps monitor and, and provide companies with anticipation on people leaving, right? So maybe <laughs> this is so relevant wrong. for really large companies. <laughs> so I'm just, you know, we've heard a lot about technology today. Does technology solve all problems? So, so the question is, what word comes to mind when you think of a service that monitors your staff and predicts who is looking to leave. Is this something, are you guys excited about this? I want to see what Andy Artel says back there. What are you going to say, Andy? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and big brother. Yeah, big brother, creepy. That was my other one. Big yeah. brother, creepy. I had helpful. creepy. Here when I think it's creepy. Because, <laughs> by the way, I can predict without the computer system. There you go. <laughs> Inaccurate. Intrusive, helpful, scary. Stalker. It's not illegal. Stalkerish. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So I thought you might say that. So the challenge for the group then is <laughs> how do you how do you retain? How do you reward people and recognize them in a way that that has them? You're not just counter offering. Right. You're not letting them think about is there a better place out there? Yeah. Um, I think you have to become the human version of this system. 
you, you know, you really, you really need your managers, your HR team, and everyone communicating regularly with people that you might put in that at-risk category. Um, having said that, AI has 11% turnover. Your number horrified me. I'm going to, because 11% is enough to deal with. Um, well, in a good in a good year, it should be anywhere in my mind anywhere from seven to 10%. Yeah. We happen to be managing a turnaround, so there's ah, yeah, yeah. a little but, more. But I will say this, Peter, on if I just isolate millennials, it's 30%. So our turnover rate is not something I'm terrifically happy with. And just a couple weeks ago, I had a blow where I lost three really young millennials in one week. All had come out of our media associate program. Oh, wow. you know, it makes me want to start crying in the corner. <clears throat> and. Um, what, what we try to do is you know, build a training program, build all of the things that, that not just the millennials, but everybody wants, but the millennials seem to be at higher risk, and my stats would, would support that. So that, again, I go back to it has to be ever-changing. It can't be, well, if we do X, Y, and Z, nobody will leave. It's got to be a constant communication back and forth with all of your employees, but certainly those you find to be at risk. Totally agree with that, with everything you just said. I, I would also say, and I know you're not saying this, but I, I'm just saying this to folks in the room, I don't think we should be afraid of turnover. So years ago, I lost a great employee to John Graham at ASAE, Lisa Yunker, and she really wanted to concentrate on running a magazine, and at AIHA, she was over our entire comms group, and she's one of, to this day, one of my best teammates ever, I think the world of her. And we had these conversations back and forth, and again, she really wanted to concentrate on this one thing, but we were small enough that we couldn't do that. You know, I just couldn't support the salary and the benefits for, I'll call it one thing, when really I needed her on these multiple things. And it forced her to make a choice. Now she chose, you know, ASA, a great choice in my opinion for her, and she, she had a great run there. So I think that's a good circumstance to lose somebody. Um, I have spent a lot of time in the last 20 or so years um, coaching people out sometimes as much as trying to coach them in. We have an employee right now at ASIS, um, a millennial, even though I hate, don't like to do that to <laughs> folks, but, and he's got two job offers right now, and he's trying to consider whether he wants to leave or not, and for him, it's about professional development. We know that about him. He's been very open about this with us, and so we've had a series of conversations, or his team has had a series of conversations this week about this. He's not driven by money. He's not driven by benefits. He really wants to be a part of a mission-oriented organization. His two offers happen to be with for-profits, which we're using to our advantage, um, because we don't think he's driven by that right now. So I think it's in those moments you've got to have those conversations. Even though HR, my HR teammate, Jeremy, doesn't like me to use this terminology because it's got legal connotations to it, and I don't mean it in that way, but it's sometimes we have to be fair. We can't always be equal. And I don't mean equal in the eyes of the law. It's not what I'm talking about. But you have to look at every employee situation and put the human yeah. lens on it sometimes and say, is this person worth a discussion, like we had with one of our staff this week? Are they not? Like, there are plenty of people I have coached out of my organizations who are good, fine people, but they weren't a fit for either our culture, where we were trying to go, what we were trying to do. And that's OK. I, I don't love big turnover rates, so when I was at my last job, we went through about a 42% turnover in 18 months, planned, deliberate. I had a, I probably can't say that I had people on a numbered list, but I did. And, um, but we, it's because we were trying to more from something to something, and everyone knew these folks were going to be not the right people. I think a turnover rate in the 7%, 10 percentile, I actually think for an organization can be healthy. I think when you get too many tenureds, Mm -hmm. Tenured folks, there's nothing wrong with being tenured. I was 15 years in my last job. But are those people also pushing themselves all the time? Really good tenured people are always learning something new every day. The tenured folks who I don't think you want to keep around are the ones who are, oh, we, well, here's how we do it, because for 20 years we did it that way kind of thing. Yeah. So how much is, is driving innovation, is driving people stretching and growing <clears throat> and trying, is, is that something, is that a behavior either of you are trying to create with your cultures? I'll let you go first. Uh, um, yes. Short answer is yes. <laughs> but it's interesting. I, I think the word innovation is interesting, like the word research. You know, so what is it? It's in the eye of the beholder. You know, innovation to a small association or a small company is very different than innovation to a much larger company, et cetera, global versus domestic, et cetera, et cetera. So short answer is yes. But I'll tell you, at least in my experience, and I would be curious to hear others what they think, but 
you don't need everybody in your organization to be as innovative as the next person. Like, I kind of don't want my accountants to be innovative. Like, I'd like them to be knowledgeable about systems and know better ways to do things and tie in better to CRM. That's all great, right? That's innovation from a finance perspective. But I really don't want them being too innovative with Gap, for example. I just yeah. don't think that's good sure. for me. So, I yeah, I think the innovation's important, but it has its places. I, I think that's probably more relevant for a commercial organizer. So for us, yeah, the yeah, idea of enough. innovation, when I'm saying innovation, I want business leaders that are looking at wh what else could I do with my business? How else could I grow? Am I willing to listen to customers and take some chances? And yeah. it, it's a big part of what we want to do. And, and, and a big part of it is, um, again, I, I want to work, at, this is a place, I, I, I'm working here, so I want it to be the type of place I like. And I have, innovated and failed at many, many things. And, and one of the things that I didn't like about it is I didn't like being judged. I didn't like being, you know, feeling like, oh my God, what's gonna happen to me because I took this chance. So for us, a big part of that is getting people to realize you will be applauded for the effort. The outcome is terrific if it's great, but we're adults, we know what this business is. You don't launch shows and expect every one of them to work. Uh, it, it's a big part of how we do it, and a lot of the ways we've driven that home is innovators are compensated for it, right? right? This is not something where you've put your bonus in jeopardy because you've tried something new. It's got to be incremental. Uh, and from that, uh, in fact, uh, tying two presentations together, Clarion act actually invented the bagged salad. I don't know if a lot of people know that. But, uh, <laughs> What's uh, the bagged salad? Sorry. Not true at all. Um, oh, that bag. Okay, salad. so I think great. we are at question point now. <laughs> yeah. So I hope that was useful. Uh, we wanted to give you as much honest, open feedback about how we've established <laughs> cultures, how we attract and retain people. Um, I, I, again, I hope it's useful. But happy to answer any questions. Well, that while that's being set up, I want to ask ask you a question. You mentioned in our discussions that um, people are, are, are coming to you, that your colleagues in the business are coming to you because they hear great things about your organization and they, and they want to work for you. So you, they want to work for your organization. What, what's an example of, of the word of mouth or the buzz or the, the, the attraction that your organization is, has that's pulling this type of uh, volunteers to work for you? Yeah, um, so I think everything I've said is really genuine. Like th this is th the notion of our, our manifesto and, and it being, it, it's, this is, I started this starting Left Field Media as a company that I, I owned and felt like if you want to work in this and flourish in this, you should join us. And I think, Sam, a lot of it is, I, I think we have a lot of happy people. I think we have people that are moving ahead they are respected, they know exactly what's going on, they know what the vision is. We are compensating them fine, you know, Blackstone just throwing money around like crazy. Um, so uh, Look at I think we've got the bases covered pretty well. And it's not, to be clear, some of them are people I've known, as, as you said, Peter, these are personal. Some of it is, you know, if you have A's, they attract more A's, mm -hmm. right? B's are scared of A's, right? Which is a really scary, a scary place to be. So okay. it isn't all about me. It is about as, as you, you know, even as we acquire businesses, right? Talent comes, we've got talent coming with acquisitions. And it's our job to make those people feel comfortable and happy because they'll attract more talented people. Okay, thank you. This is on, okay. I Many of us, have, and if not all of us, share our mission statements, whether they be in presentations or on websites or in our lobby or in our brochures. And many of our mission statements, um, which I really appreciate, say our people come first. Our people are the, w the reason we are successful. Our people do this and that. So I've always bought on, uh, off on that as, as a core value. I'm wondering if you all have either considered or in fact, decided to share your cultural manifesto with clients as a means of transparency, as a means of a confidence builder. If a salesperson is in front of a client and presenting about your value proposition or your solution, if they also talk about how you treat or how what the, the uh, environment that they immerse themselves with. So it's not just the mission statement, but it's the culture manifesto that you have for your company. And if you think that would be a 
bad idea because it's too transparent or if it would be a something that would be welcomed by your customers and prospects? Well, from my perspective, we don't have a written cultural manifesto. I don't know, though, that it would be useful to our sales team, for example. Um, I think we do have a reputation as a good company in a multitude of ways, and, and I think that's used where, where it's useful. But again, not a written statement that I think could be shared. Yeah, so I'll take your question, but I'll take it maybe from a different angle. So on the, I'm usually on the buying side, right? So I usually have some really great companies coming in to, to try to sell something, and I'll use MDG if I can as an example, because I can see Kimberly right there. You know, you know the right partner when they walk in the door, in my, my opinion. And, you know, we tend to be a highly collaborative, not a top-down organization. That's not what I personally want to build at, at ASIS. We tend to be probably too transparent at times. I question that sometimes, are we too transparent? We want to do business with organizations that want to collaborate, that want to do business, we want to do it. The culture matters to me in that way. And when a company like MGG, for example, walks through the door and gives a presentation, they're, they're not just giving me, I, I can't recall, Kimberly, if you all gave us your, your, your cultural manifesto, I don't think you did, but they, they, um, they, um, they demonstrated it in how they each interacted with each other. So what we saw in the, in the meeting, if you will, in the sales pitch meeting, uh, whatever you want to call it, right, was a group of very curious people, really talented in their own ways, really motivated in their own ways to get our business, but also there are pieces of this particular part of the business that each of them had their own interest in, but it was clear they'd also had all talked to each other. And it was a no, no question. Um, we're an MCI, a Wyndham Jade MCI client. Wyndham Jade, MCI now, right? They do business the way we want it done. We want to be collaborative. We need to call a spade a spade. When we, that means when we've done something as a client that's, or, or aren't doing something, they've got to be able to say to us, hey, what gives? And we have to be able to have the same conversations. I think whether or not you, your sales folks are handing out a manifesto or, or a mission or vision statement, I think that is less what I look for. It's more of what are you demonstrating to me when you're in the room? You know, and that, that culture fit from at least my association perspective when we look at, at vendor partners, because I really do see vendors not as vendors but as partners, that, that cultural fit matters. At my last job, we were an experienced client for, well, they were an experienced client before I got there. And what we loved about Experient was they did business the way AIHA did business. And believe me, we had our moments in time where the one party or the other wasn't always happy. But we had this relationship where we talked about it like a like a good marriage. You know, there were times where you had to just be like, "This isn't working. Here, here's why." So, so we do share ours pretty openly. So it's on the website. <clears throat> uh, it's I, I wouldn't necessarily use it as a sales tool with a, a with a customer. I wouldn't think, but it, it's it's also as we interview candidates, we put it in front of them as a, "Do you want to be here?" Right? Like this is really um, somebody could read this and say, "Oh my God, that's the company I've been waiting to find," and somebody could say, "That doesn't sound like it's for me." So we're we're quite open about it. Question right there, please. Peter, so smart, he already answered my question, which is going to be <laughs> how important is culture when you're trying to choose who to partner with and, and buy from. So I'll just say, let's go Caps. <laughs> <laughs> I just scored tickets for Saturday night, so I agree. Let's go Caps. <laughs> While I was in the back. Question in the back, and then we'll do one from the polling, from the second screen. Have you ever run into a problem where your core values, where your manifesto has, I don't want to say brought on legal issues, but have been used legally against you in some way, shape, or form because an employee wasn't happy, and yet in this core value or in this manifesto, it states blah, blah, blah. And I noticed you mentioned earlier about a test that you give. and. I didn't think those things were, uh, those kind of tests were legally allowed per se uh, in developing your staff. So I'd just be curious to hear some of that. Um, never had a legal issue on the you know, mission statement or any, any sort of value statement. And the tests are, they're not illegal by any stretch. They can be controversial and I think they could be they could get you into legal trouble if you only used them on certain people versus everyone, every candidate, yeah. which is how we approach it. So, no, we have not had any, any legal problems with it. Uh, as I said, we rolled it out in September, so you know, I'll let you know if, uh, 
class action suit is brewing. Um, so I will say actually quite the opposite is I've had tough conversations with people citing their lack of living the values, right? That I told you this is, this is what a star looks like here and you're not doing some of these things. So I've used it not in a harsh way, but I've used it in a honest communication way to say from the day you walked in, we talked about this is, this is what, you know, how we operate and the bar is high. Um, so that's. Yeah, and I'll be careful how I answer your question because I don't want to come across the wrong way, but I will say that one and only one time has somebody attempted to do that and they stopped when I explained what a small world they were trying to live and work in. Yeah. Woo, okay, <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, we, let's do one of the questions from, uh, from the second screen. Um, new staff, six months into their tenure, and ask them to describe the culture, what happens when their answer does not match what you think the culture is? Oh, Bill Reed, that could never happen. <laughs> of course, Bill, go ahead, I'm sorry. We, we do what we call a new employee lunch every six months with myself and the CEO. And um, we take people from three to nine months in, in that lunch. And we talk about everything, you know, what don't you like, what's going wrong. He's really good at asking what, what's bad, <laughs> which is really, it's hard to sit and listen to sometimes, but it's great feedback. Um, specific to culture, we, we don't ask for that match, but we're obviously looking for it. Yeah, similar. Yeah. yeah. Okay, back there we have a question. Thank you. Hi, so I wanted to ask a question about diversity. You talked, you talked about referrals that are employee referrals going to certain universities. A lot of those approaches can wind up with a pretty homogeneous racial gender group of people. And so I was wondering what your approach is to ensure that you get a diversity of different kinds of racial, ethnic, gender people that still align to the cultures that you have. Because this is not exactly the most diverse group of people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, I think ASAE and others have done some really great work around diversity and inclusion. So if you're looking for more information on that, we can, I'm sure John or, or somebody could, could, um, could help you with that. You know, I, I, this is why I think D&I programs have to be cultivated. Because when you go, like my last association was represented basically occupational health and safety professionals. They're basically old white men. That's who went to school 25 years ago to study OC Health and industrial hygiene and, and so on and so forth. There's no ready pool, if you will, of females or, 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 or folks of different color, let alone folks from outside the US, et cetera. So <clears throat> I think the, the work that ASAE has done around this, <clears throat> pardon me, has demonstrated that ultimately you have to cultivate this. So for example, when we have open positions, I make sure that I use the diversity executive leadership program, DELP, right? Um, website. I make sure that my HR partner is going to very specific uh, places that have clear diverse pools in them. The challenge is getting the candidates. So I, I have turned over for a number of people the last two and a half years and we used a recruiter in particular to help us with some of the more senior roles because we just had to fill them faster than I, we could do them on our own. And um, it was extraordinarily difficult to find really seasoned um, senior professionals with, I'll call it obvious diversity, and I'll call it not so obvious diversity. It was very challenging. So I, there's no, I don't know a magic answer to it, except keep cultivating, keep cultivating, keep cultivating, and know of places, whether it's ASAE's DELP or PCMA may have its own version of diversity executive leadership program, whatever it may be, just make sure that you're consciously going to those, to those, um, those gardens to see what you can harvest and, and be willing organizationally and personally to, to find and or, I do not love this word mentor, but find and or mentor some of these very fine folks yourself. Because if each of us did that, these pools would be much more diverse, much more quickly. Well, this is, this is not a surprise. We've gotten a lot of wonderful questions in on the second screen. And I think it was Margaret Kaur who said, embrace uh, you know, going into an area where you don't know the answer. Well, I'm gonna be there right now. Somehow we're going to hopefully capture all of your questions that we didn't get a chance to answer and uh, in the next couple of days, I'll try to figure out what to do with them. Well, but, we, we've, uh, we've actually started setting up a chat bot to okay. answer all of the... Uh, <laughs> Betty, all right, thank you. Betty we have the first chat bot. I don't bot. think HR will like that very much. <laughs> all right, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank Great you. job. Thank you.